Today, Honda announced a new 2025 update for their NT1100 mid-range Tourer. And while I already thought this was a really good bike when I reviewed it at the launch of the previous generation, I will admit there are a couple of small problems with it, some of which seem really quite basic. Thankfully though, this new 2025 version I think fixes pretty much all of those shortcomings, and that could take what's already a very good bike and turn it, potentially, into a great one. So in this video, we'll go through all of the details with the nine key things that you need to know about it. Now, perhaps it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that this was already a good bike with really good fundamentals because it's based upon the same platform and engine as their long-proven Africa Twin adventure bike. That means, of course, that you're not going to get a super sporty bike with really sharp handling. It can't really compete with stuff like the S1000XR from BMW, the Yamaha Tracer 9 or the Suzuki GSX S1000 GT. But what you do get is a really usable bike that's very pleasant to ride. Obviously, a huge part of that is the engine with that same parallel twin as the Africa Twin. And it actually got quite a few updates earlier this year that now trickle down to the NT1100 for 2025. So the airbox gets longer intake ducts and longer internal trumpets. There are new ECU settings. The compression ratio has gone up a little bit. And you've got redesigned piston crowns and new comrods and a new crankshaft. Now, as a result of all this work, you don't actually get any more peak power. It's still 100 horsepower at 7,500 RPM. But like I say, that's not really what this engine was about. It's all about mid-range and bottom-end guts. And it's got a really nice sound to it with that 270-degree crank. And that's really what they focused on. So they now say there's a broader spread of power across the entire rev range. And you've also got a fairly healthy boost in peak torque. So it goes from 105 newton meters to 112 at the same 6250 rpm so yeah for me this feels like a particularly worthwhile update for this genre and style of bike and it really does play to the existing strengths of this engine and doubles down on what it already does really well I think it's fair to say as well that one of the key selling points of this bike and some of the other Hondas is the fact that you can spec them up with their DCT system or dual clutch transmission. That means you can run them in an automatic mode so you no longer need to operate the clutch and the shifter. And again, that builds upon this very refined and practical and usable image. Up until now as well, Honda have pretty much had the market to themselves in terms of automatic bikes, but it does look like that's all about to change with BMW, Yamaha and KTM all announcing plans for automatic bikes in their lineup, which I assume will be announced in the next few months. So it seems like a good idea for Honda to get their stuff together right now and make sure that DCT is as good as it can possibly be. And I will say, although generally I think it's a really good system, there are a couple of areas in which it does feel like it could be improved. One of them would be low speed and those sort of tricky maneuvers where it can be a little bit jerky, especially given that you don't have the clutch. And the other is when you start to pick up the pace a bit and ride a bit quicker and you start barreling into corners. Now, one of the things it's good to see that's carried over from the Africa Twin is the introduction of the inertial measurement unit. And so that means lean angles can be fed into some of the electronics. So you now get cornering ABS, cornering traction control, and also rear wheel lift control. But the thing is, as another benefit, those lean angles can now be fed into the DCT system. And so it should be able to shift more appropriately if it detects that the bike's banked over and therefore you can assume cornering. So yeah, I'm hoping that's a bit of an improvement to the quicker riding, but they also say they've worked on the throttle response of the bike so that it's got a more even spread of torque at lower RPMs. And the DCT, they also said, has been optimized in the lower speed response. So again, the other side of it that I thought was a little bit tricky and took some getting used to, while well, hoping it now feels easier to control and more intuitive. Now, another feature that I mentioned in the review was missing from the Africa Twin was the option to spec the bike with their semi-active electric suspension and the reason I'd like to see it here is because I really do think it suits probably touring motorcycles the best where you might be going between fairly long stints on the motorway and then straight into more engaging country roads and you might go between those two things multiple times in the same day with semi-active suspension it will constantly adjust the damping in real time to make sure it's comfy when you're going in a straight line for example it'll firm up when you start to brake and accelerate harder and corner 
And so of course you'll benefit from that massively and all without having to pull over and get tools out to adjust the suspension. The other side of a touring motorcycle as well is the fact that you might go from riding solo in the week, you might use it for commuting, but then also maybe do two up rides at the weekend or fill up the luggage and do a weekend away. And so the ability to electronically adjust preload to make sure the bike sits level regardless of how much you got stacked up on it. Well, again, it's a massive convenience, a big improvement. And so I think a lot of people will probably be choosing this electronic suspension package if they buy a new NT1100 from now on. So look, that's some of the more fancy features dealt with, but I think it was some of the more simple, rudimentary stuff that just felt like Honda could have done quite a bit better. Generally, I'd say one of the big strengths of this bike is the wind protection. You've got a nice big windscreen, some deflectors to push the air around your shoulders, lots of bodywork to keep your torso dry, and also some really well thought out lower deflectors that did an amazing job on the wet press ride that we were doing of keeping both your shins and your feet bone dry. Genuinely, I was really, really impressed with it, but the only thing that was quite difficult was the fact that the windscreen was not that easy to adjust, and your only option really was to jump off the bike and do it with both hands, so not at all practical or convenient. I was actually pretty surprised that Honda let this one slip through the net, and so it's good to see on this particular 2025 bike they've now addressed it, because the new windscreen is adjustable and you can do it if you want just with your left hand. That means you can keep the throttle steady with your right while you make any changes. And it's also got five steps in the height, so riders of all different sizes should be able to find a setting that suits them to minimize buffeting. In fact, I really specifically remember saying in that video that while my shins and shoes and pretty much my whole body was completely dry despite the poor weather, the only part of my body that did get a bit soggy was my heels and the back of my shoes because of some of the spray from the rear wheel. So I'm guessing Honda might have had some similar feedback from elsewhere, potentially from their customers because they now say they've got a 150 millimeter longer splash guard at the rear, which should just help to keep spray down that little bit more. Now I've been comparing the two pictures of this generation and the previous gen, and I can't quite make out where that particular part sits, maybe just below the license plate at the rear there, but either way, it sounds like a good thing, especially if you're doing a lot of tours or commuting in less than ideal weather conditions. One thing I couldn't specifically comment on was actually the standard saddle, because the press bike that I was riding had their comfort accessory seat fitted, and yeah, it's probably not fair to judge it based upon something you have to pay a bit extra for. Thing is though, I've done a bit of research on some owner's reviews and the standard seat did come up as a bit of a complaint for some of the riders. And again, it seems like Honda have taken this into account for 2025 because it's now 20% larger in terms of surface area, so that should help riders to spread their weight a little more comfortably. At the same time, they've kept the seat height at 820 mil, which is fairly manageable for a decent range of riders. And they also say they've managed to preserve the standover. So I assume the saddle's no wider at the front. You know what, there was another area as well in which it seemed they'd managed to turn a potential positive into a negative, and that was with the luggage. You see, on the one hand, you can't really argue with getting a pair of side cases thrown in for the standard asking price. And they look pretty nice as well. They were in keeping with the look of the bike, and probably a bit cleaner looking and more integrated than if you went third party. Thing is though, they were 33 liters on the left, 32 on the right, and so that meant you couldn't quite fit in a full face helmet, which is a bit of a deal breaker, I think, for some people who like to go touring, where you wanna leave your helmet locked away in the bike when you're walking around if you're stopping off on a ride. So yeah, I reckon it'd be pretty disappointing to buy a bike with luggage thrown in, only to have to then go third party at your own cost just to fit your lid in, so again, great news for 2025 is that they've made the lids of the cases 25 millimeters deeper, and that takes the total volume up to 37 liters on the left now and 36 on the right. Now Honda say specifically that's enough to fit a full face helmet in each, so one for yourself and one for your passenger. Although in the past I've ridden bikes where they've said the storage is big enough for a full face helmet and it actually hasn't been. So I'll have to test this one out when we get hold of a press bike as soon as they become available in the next few months. I don't think this was ever going to be a particularly exciting bike to look at. Honda tend to be, you know, fairly conservative in their design choices. And it is a touring bike after all, it's never going to be the most exuberant. But the fact that they released it in just white, grey or black, well I thought it was a bit disappointing, especially if you're someone who likes a 
a bike that looks that little bit more colourful. Now to be fair there were some annual updates since where they did give you a few other options so I think there was a blue and perhaps a red last year as well. But yeah for 2025 again it's good to see that the Pearl Hawkside blue stays in the lineup. There is a gunmetal black metallic if you do want to keep things stealth but also this matte warm ash metallic which has a bit of a sort of gold look to it and I think this one looks really classy and well suited to a touring bike like this. On top of that you've got a couple of sticker packs as well available. I don't have any pictures right now. If I get any I'll put them on the screen when we do the edit on this video. But if you are someone who likes that more vibrant appearance, then at least there are a couple of options. And I think that's the thing now. You can go from the very subtle and subdued black version if you want something that doesn't particularly stand out from the crowd. But you can work your way up through those other colours and even slap some stickers on them as well. So there should be something to suit a wider variety of tastes. Now as for the price, well, it's actually exactly the same year over year, both for the base bike and the DCT version. And look, for all the standard the kit and equipment that you get in, I think that's pretty good value for money. So you've got a TFT display, which works really well. It's touchscreen too, and also offers CarPlay, which you don't get on many bikes. And then there's heated grips, a center stand, USB and ACC sockets, and also cruise control fitted as standard, as well as some other neat little techie bits like self-canceling indicators and their emergency stop signals. Then you've got three riding modes as standard with a couple of custom slots so you can get it set up to your personal preference. And so yeah, I don't think you can really argue with all that equipment for this sort of price. Naturally, you'll pay a little bit more for the electronic suspension version. But like I say, it really does suit, for me, a touring bike like this. And in the past, on press launches and stuff like that, I've been able to jump between two versions of the same bike. One with electronic semi-active suspension, one without. And it really is a substantial difference in terms of having that comfort and composure all in one package. And so I'm definitely expecting this one to be one of the more significant upgrades for this bike. So yeah, it's not a massive revelation for this bike. It's not a humongous update. But I'm still impressed with what Honda have done because it feels like they've done a thorough job of researching some of the problems with the bike and then meticulously gone through and eliminated them. As always though, I'd love to know what you think of them, so do let me know down in the comments below. And also, if you think that there's anything that they've missed, well, let me know that as well. Now I'll leave my review of the previous generation NT1100 on the screen now, so you can give it a click and give it a watch if you haven't already, ahead of me getting the new one to review in a couple of months. And in the meantime, do hit subscribe if you want to see more of the latest motorcycle news like this right here on Motobob. A massive thanks for watching today, and we'll see you in the next video.